So hello everyone, my name is Konstantinos Kalantzis and on behalf of the Photo Demos Collective, I would like to welcome you and thank you for being here. This is the final session for today. And the title of the session is The Domestic and the Civil and the Political. We have a excellent panel of speakers who will explore the intersections of these categories with photography. A quick note before we go on, feel free to post questions in the chat box anytime. We also encourage you to use the raise the hand function and make comments live during the Q&A at the end of the session. The panel is recorded as all of the others uh, in this uh, series of events and will be uploaded on YouTube to accommodate colleagues who are unable to log in given time difference. You can find the YouTube link in the chat box. Regularly we'll be pasting the, the link. Uh, I'll be introducing speakers uh, right before they present. So I'll start with our first speaker, Taslima Akhtar. Taslima is a Magnum Fellow photographer and activist who has worked over a decade on garment workers' lives. Her final embrace image became the iconic photo of the Rana Plaza disaster in which more than a thousand workers died. She has edited a book on the Rana Plaza called, in English translation, 14th April, Our Cries of Thousand Souls. She has also served as an editor of ArtThousandCries.org and coordinated the Memorial Quilt Project. Taslima teaches at Pathshala South Asian Media Institute and has published extensively on women and workers' issues. She is president of the Bangladesh Garment Workers Solidarity Organization. Her paper is entitled Collectivities and the New Reality, Photographic Activism in a Time of COVID. Taslima, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, and all of you uh, for here. Um, uh, before sharing some of my work, I want to say a few things about collectivities and new reality. Uh, it is obvious that the history of art, history of journalism, history of using camera exhibiting and curating photos in gallery or in museum are not something different from history of society and political economy. At the same time, history of generating, gathering and distributing knowledge can also not be separated from the history of class, race, gender and identities politics. So today, when I will talk about my photography, my practices in my city, it's not about only uh, my experience. I think when I'm going to talk with all of you, I'm uh, obviously uh, telling you something about my society and my surroundings. And no doubt that the hegemony of uh, capitalist culture is always controlling us. It's control our body, mind, gesture, our wishes, dreams, everything. It wants to make us an individual alien rather than being we. In this atmosphere, we always feel lost and alienated. To decide things about thyself and decide about the collective responsibility. But without the people surrounding us, without the collective effort, and without the existence of others, we are nobody. And I'm also nobody without. So today I'm presenting my work shaped by collectivity and community that surrounds me. Every day with new realization, I feel that the hegemonic culture always tries to make us inactive as a witness. It tries to erase our history, our struggle, it has been taking control over the history of knowledge, camera, images, and all this potential from the majority of people. So usually when we take or create any image or exhibit image, most of the time we don't make it for us. We do not, we do it for the hegemonic dominance. We sell us in the market to survive not to live with dignity, with freedom of expression. But I want to live my life with collectivity. 
I want to have control on my life and I want to give back control over our energies. That's the reason I feel responsibility to use camera as a tool of activism. I want to use camera images to tell our narratives as a collective from our, as a collective. But uh, the journey of mine is not a lonely process. I believe what I have learned through my beloved community, with my friends, through my struggle, our struggle, I learned that it is a collective process. Uh, so today I will share some of uh, my experiences uh, that I got from my community, my surroundings, my society. Uh, all of you know that uh, I have been working for the last 13 years uh, on garment workers, uh, their struggle, their life. So I will show few works that I have said uh, from 2008 with community and with collectivity. Uh, I want to show you a few things. In 2008, um, I started to document garment workers' life, actually their daily life. Um, I uh, tried to make a relation uh, with those people who are uh, making a big thing in our economy. More than 4 million workers are working there and a big part of uh, them are women. So when I see them, when I look at them every morning, they're going to uh, factories, I feel encouraged, I feel strength from them. And I also feel responsibility to be with them. days uh, of uh, being with them uh, and taking photographs of their daily life, their struggle. Um, I uh, try to understand their own way, how they want to represent themselves. And I collected a few photos from workers uh, that they took from the studio nearby and a um, few photos from studio. And I saw that uh, when I took photograph that time, um, I tried to show the reality, but when they themselves um, go to in a studio, uh, they want to show them uh, in a dignified way and they don't want to show any uh, cruel situation, poor situation of their life to be. Yes. And after a few years, in 2013, um, there is a collapse happened in Rana Plaza in Dhaka City, the capital of our country, and more than 1,000 workers died. That time I found them. And all of you know about this photo. I don't want to tell much more about this. And when more than 1,000 workers died from my side and from our uh, workers' rights organization, we tried to collect uh, poster photos that hang by the family member who were looking for the, their beloved. Uh, family members and beloved person. And we collect these uh, posters made by themselves uh, from different wall and their family member. And they are the missing workers uh, from hundred uh, and more than hundred uh, thousand workers. And we collected all missing workers uh, photographs. And I think that it's obvious it, it could, it possible because all family members, they posted uh, these images to us. Uh, they write 
um, letter to us and they send photos. So it's not uh, that I collected all this photo. They uh, took participation in this process of uh, collecting uh, this thing. Uh, this is a 480 page Bangla book on Rana Plaza collapse. And actually, I think that uh, uh, in usually we don't get uh, the history of working class people. And um, I thought that it's very important to tell the story, to tell the narratives and struggles of workers and uh, keep the uh, history of their struggles. So we collected their stories uh, of Rana Plaza's workers and made this book. And we also translated uh, this book uh, in English and we collected many photographs from different uh, photographers and from family albums of workers. And this is also, uh, we organize uh, exhibition at Kala South Asia which name is 1134 exhibition, Life's Not Numbers. And artists, uh, photographer from different sites, they uh, participated in this exhibition and they raised voice together. Now I, I will tell you another story. Uh, it's about our memorial quilt. In fifth anniversary of Rana Plaza collapse, we tried to collect those passport size photo uh, from family, and we um, made together and decided to uh, make memorial quilt uh, through stitching in a very traditional uh, Nokshi Katha and workers' family. They stitch uh, by themselves, uh, and they wrote uh, different emotional text uh, on the and when uh, I think that uh, when they are using photographs and they are using their stitching process and their own uh, voice with this image that uh, then it uh, become more powerful and that time we raise a call that um, remember the dead and fight for the living. And through uh, the uh, through last few years, um, uh, I feel that uh, by the collective uh, effort, we can make our voice more strong. And we were trying to work together. And when COVID uh, heated in our country, that time we all scattered. And it was not possible to move from one place to another place. And that time I found that the workers and the general people, they started to use their smartphone. They started to use Zoom, YouTube as a new tool, which uh, they were not uh, familiar before. And when COVID hit us, uh, we have um, got a word uh, several times that uh, our government, our owners, brands, everybody were saying that uh, people should maintain social distancing, they should stay at home, but the government's worker, they hadn't get any scope to stay home. They bound to go out because of uh, their wage and their livelihood. So it was very difficult for me to go uh, workplace because that time the public transport was closed. So I thought maybe we can uh, think about uh, collecting photo from workers. And uh, actually um, we collected many photographs from um, workers, workers, organizer, their family member, because that time there was no scope and the journalists who are very much known, who are working at uh, National Daily, they were also not moving one place to another place. So these photographs actually uh, um, taken by uh, workers and workers' family member. 
And I don't want I don't want to mention the name of workers uh, because um, I think sometimes it's a problem because uh, when photographer like Shahidul Alam uh, is always uh, in always under threat. So when the workers or citizen they uh, started to keep their history struggle, it, it would be a, a threatened issue for them. So I just want to show you a few photos, but I don't want to mention their name. Uh, he is also a garment worker and he affected by COVID. And um, he uh, was in his village uh, and he had to stay a remote village and he had to stay far away from his home. So he took his own photograph uh, and I talked with him that it will be um, very um, emergency and very urgent that if he uh, can take his own photograph. And this is the house where he lived that time. And this is also taken by this uh, worker, his mother. And that time uh, uh, we tried to uh, give uh, some support to workers, uh, some uh, health support, some food support and other things. And these all photographs uh, taken by workers, workers, family member and organizer. And it was very difficult for us to communicate. So we use uh, sometimes Facebook, sometime uh, Zoom, uh, and it was very new for workers and actually for me also to using Zoom, StreamYard and other things. So we try to communicate each other, try to organize ourselves uh, through Zoom or Facebook. And I saw that workers started to make Facebook live more than And when COVID um, hit our country, that time uh, the Bangladeshi garment workers who earned the 80% export income from our country, uh, they faced uh, termination, layoff, um, wage crisis. And that time um, it was a little bit uh, impossible to organize protests because uh, for a few days, uh, like two weeks, a uh, factory also closed. That time, some workers, they were doing protests uh, on street. And at the same time, they organized an uh, online uh, protest. And they uh, made their photographs uh, on self. Uh, the placard is about uh, against uh, the termination, layoff, and the social discrimination of uh, COVID. This all all photos made by them. Um, uh, maybe you know about Shahidul Alam, and he, here here are some people who were. Uh, uh, from uh, like a university teacher, activist, uh, anthropologist, photographer. Uh, they also showed their solidarity with workers. And they spread this photo on Facebook. And it is interesting that they did their own and started uh, this video. This is from uh, worker of A1 Garments. This factory closed when COVID uh, hit it in 2020 and they were not getting their um, wages. Still, they are not getting their wages. So she made the, her own uh, video with help of others. Just I want to... Ami, ami, 
ব্যবসা দিয়ে প্রতিদিন প্রতি মাসে মাসে আমাদেরকে uh she was talking about uh, the crisis of not getting the wages and her struggle with family and kids and other thing and uh, they posted this video on the and rock plaza anniversary came that time also workers organized different kind of program and they you know, posted photos on facebook like this and this photo also taken by them um and, and it is interesting that uh, when they are talking about their struggle they are taking photographs keeping the history of their life and struggle at the same time uh, they are taking photographs of uh, their different occasion like Eid, which is a uh, Muslim uh, religious festival and big festival. And I saw that they have taken their own photograph in religious Eid. And it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, interesting uh, for me that they are looking themselves with uh, dignity and they have taken the photo from low angle and it's uh, give a, a different um, expression. And this is also from the, they're taking selfie. And this photo is from last, um, well, two months ago, uh, when uh, workers uh, were in village because uh, all factory was closed for the Eid festival and um, the owner said that yes uh, they don't need to come because government declared a two weeks uh, vacation or, so they don't need to come but suddenly they declared that they should come if they they will not come they will cut their wages they will face layoff so he, to come back because all local transport, public transport was closed. So they came and back to the, their house and their working place like this when it was not possible for us because when the last lockdown uh, happened that time, uh, we were not able to move one place to another place for the public transport. And it was not possible for me also to take photograph. So I collected these photographs from workers and their family members. And I think um, it's it's a collective effort, and um, uh, yeah. So I want to finish now. Uh, and so I think that. Uh, um, I want to use my camera as a tool of activism, and I don't think that it's a personal tool or creating image, telling story, all these things uh, need to be personal. Uh, if we, uh, or if we uh, become together, uh, we can make our tool more stronger. So um, I think that uh, without collective effort, without uh, uh, be united, it is impossible to tell our own story, own uh, struggle. So, uh, yes, uh, this is from me. Uh, if you have any question, then yes, of course. Thank you. Slima, thank you for the powerful exposition. Um, our next speaker is Oksana Sarkisova. Oksana is a research fellow at the Blink and Open Society Archives co-founder of Visual Studies Platform at Central European University and director of the Verzio Documentary Film Festival in Budapest. She works on film, memory, politics, and amateur photography. She's co-editor of the 2008 book, Past for the Eyes, East European Representations of Communism in Cinema and Museums after 1989, and author of Screening Soviet Nationalities, Culture Films from the Far North to Central Asia, 2017 book. She's currently working on a book project called Snapshots Histories, co-authored with Olga Sevchenko, which is coming out soon. 
The title of Oksana's paper is What's in a Frame? Image Practices and Material Lives of Family Photographs in Russia. Oksana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Konstantinos, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hope you can see it uh, and also hear me okay. Is the sound okay? Yes. Wonderful. Perfect. So uh, it's it's wonderful wonderful to be here. Thank you also to Christopher and to the photo demos group for inviting me to join this exciting event and to uh, all the participants for stimulating presentations and discussions and to everyone who is in the audience and is willing to discuss as well. I will present a short discussion of the Soviet time domestic photo collections and the multiple ways in which the photographs contribute to the interpretation of the past. My examples are drawn from research that I undertake jointly with Olga Shevchenko that uh, Konstantinos already mentioned, in which we discuss memories of socialism with multi-generational families in Russia. And I'm also very happy that Olga joined us at this panel and may join for discussion as well. I also would like to acknowledge the support of the Iconis Center for the Theory and History of the Image and Nomis Foundation, which allowed us to jointly advance with this project. And hopefully the uh, book manuscript will uh, truly be completed soon as uh, Konstantinos also already announced. Um, memories of, um, uh, of the period uh, change uh, substantially as uh, family lore is passed through personal communication, which in turn is affected by the frameworks of cultural memory circulating in the public sphere about socialism. In sifting through the family pictures, each generation has its own stake and its own turn to fill the familiar images with meaning. Not only do family photographs provide visual metaphors for the past, but they also stand in for the people and events that one didn't live to encounter in person, offering an opportunity and pretext to tell stories, contemplate or confabulate. In all these ways, family snapshots become for the new generation of owners an invitation to exercise their historical imagination. Family photographs themselves are not static. There are multiple interrelated contexts that spur image mobility, including the transition from rural to urban living, the circumstances surrounding passing photographs from one generation to the next, and the instances when images move from the realm of private viewing to public display. Most children come of age, they often borrow and fuse images from their parents' collections with their own, creating visual statements about themselves and their families that reframe the photographs in the perspective of the next generation. Each context is associated with a specific set of image practices that is culturally prescribed ways in which photographs are expected to be interacted and engaged with. Domestic collections testify to the expectations that photographs have the power to somehow materialize and capture the memories. And here are just uh, two examples uh, where the snapshot inscriptions at times go beyond entrusting photographs with the task of preserving a treasured memory, conflating the two altogether. As in the photographs on the slide on the left in the remembrance of military service, in one album, we even came across memory on the motorcycle. And yet, if the connection between memory and snapshot photography is not accidental, neither it is entirely natural. What exactly do these photographs implore their viewers to remember? And how do their meanings change, especially after their subjects have passed away? Jan Asman distinguishes between everyday communicative memory that is passed on in personal interaction and the longer running horizon of cultural memory that comprises the forms of objectivized culture, including <clears throat> various forms of public display. However practical, seeing these horizons as a binary is misleading. The stories shared over a family album along relics, relics, uh, sorry, there was just a, a message. Uh, the cautionary tales, the keepsakes that are treasured and the experiences cast aside as irrelevant all exist in an implicit dialogue with the models preserved in cultural memory and available in the public sphere. The entanglement of communicative and cultural memory become particularly complex 
as one moves from the notion of personal biographical memory to the events that preceded one's birth. Marianne Hirsch highlighted the interplay of remembrance and imagination that happens when photographs become embroiled with memory work carried out by the members of post generation, that is, people born and raised in the aftermath of traumatic events they didn't witness, but which loom large over their sense of personal and family history. But after the generation post, there are many other, many more to follow. The challenge of interpreting family pictures lies in their immersion in different pasts as memory interweaves with private fantasy and public history, as Patricia Holland put it. So over the past decade, publicly available models of the national past in Russia have continued to move towards reintegrating the pre and post revolutionary narratives, sidelining instances of violence and injustice perpetuated by the Soviet state in favor of the emerging master narrative that emphasizes collective achievements at the expense of human cost. And yet, whether due to the dynamic of generational exchange within the family or photographs capacity to direct vision and sentiment in unexpected ways, there is no possibility to fully contain the unruliness of the images and predict how they will be used. The following examples demonstrate the range of potentialities for reimagining the past that is done with family photography in Russia and point to the interrelatedness of the communicative and cultural memory horizons. So here is a blog entry, which self-consciously puts nostalgia into the center of the narrative accompanied by a snapshot. To an attentive eye, there is an obvious discrepancy. While the author writes about her nostalgia for the 1960s, the image is actually from the late 70s, early 80s. Even misdated vernacular photographs exert a powerful evidential appeal. They are intimate, instantly familiar, and emotionally positively charged, seemingly catching life in its daily immediacy. But the conversations we had with the owners of family photo collections demonstrate that nostalgia is only one modality of viewing the images. Family photos can be seen as a laboratory of reformatting the image of the past. Such reformatting is effective because the assumption of ownership opens the way to imagination and projection. So consider this example. The photograph depicts Marina in her role as a kindergarten teacher and nurse in the post war years. This photograph triggered a chain of memories about the years she spent educating and cultivating children. Her primary goal, as she saw it, was to inculcate in children a sense of responsibility and self-reliance, which would make them capable of functioning independently and providing for themselves in a group context. The very same image was spontaneously selected by her granddaughter, 20-year-old at the time. And for her, the snapshot of uniformed children around the bear table spoke eloquently about the material and emotional depravities of the Soviet upbringing. And here is a quote from um, the interview. Perhaps these are Granny's kids. I don't know why, but they all strike me as very similar, poor little distressed children. I think it's a precise representation of the century in which these children lived. Things are so different now. Our teachers today are not wearing white robes. And here the kids are even dressed in the same checkered fabric, all these shaped heads to prevent lice, I suppose. I pity them. In today's Russia, multiple groups and actors mobilize photography in support of their own rhetorical takes on the virtues and flaws of the Soviet system. Often the meaning and significance of images is taken for granted. But I want to give one more example to show how active engagement with photographs can give in the words of Ariel Azoulay a renewed sanction to the gap between the world and the picture. So here is a website of a project that in the past years received a lot of media traction. It is a self-fashioned investigation of Denis Karagodin to explore the details of the execution of his great-grandfather killed by the NKVD Soviet secret police in the wave of great purges in 1938 and to put the perpetrators on trial posthumously. In the early 2010s, Denis Karagodin, who is a great-grandson of Stepan Karagodin, came across a stack of photos kept in a makeshift folder repurposed from a plastic milk container. 
which the family inherited from his grandfather's brother. These were group family portraits made at the beginning of the 20th century in the Far East, where the family came um, through the resettlement program and engaged in land cultivation. As Karagodin recalls, it was at, this, uh, at the moment of scanning this family photo archive to transform the analog to a digital collection that gave an additional impulse to the initiative to collect more information about the family. So Stepan Karagodin was born in 1881 and had a large family, 13 children in all. With an extended kin, they built a stable household in the Amur area. But during the Stalin time collectivization, the family was dispossessed and exiled in 1928, coming to live in Tomsk in Siberia. Later, already in Tomsk, he was arrested again and executed in 1938 on the fake grounds of espionage. He was rehabilitated posthumously in 1955. The rediscovery of the family archive uh, gave rise to two projects, the genealogical history of the family and the investigation into the execution on karagodin.org. Along with research on the files in the secret police archives, Karagodin assembled large photographic collection, including images of perpetrators. The latter come from a variety of sources, from official documents and private collections, and they're placed side by side, side by side with the documents, often enhanced by color and the AI that animates the static images. In doing so, Karagodin reframes and recontextualizes the images. A family photograph of Stepan Karagodin is cropped um, to make it look at, like an ID image on the front page, but it actually comes from a family portrait uh, of his, with his wife and son that was taken in 1930. There are also conventional images of summer holidays or family snapshot, snapshots that become incriminating visual material when he uh, introduces the executioners. Here we see one of the Ankaradi officers identified on a typical vacation group photo on the Black Sea and enlarged uh, to the medium close-up. The sources are not credited and the presentation of the photographs make no, makes no difference between various provenances and genres of photographs. The use of images I would like to suggest open up the gap between the photo and photography, exposing the social relations and realities that underlie the most banal and familiar images, package tours or family outings, erasing the convenient separation into the private and public for authority figures. Commenting on his quest um, in the conversation that we had, Karagudin emphasized that, uh, quote, there are no ready answers. I have actually constructed the reality in you. I have reassembled it. I can say that this is my perception of reality, unquote. The project's public outreach brought new unexpected results. The granddaughter of the officer vacationing in Sochi in 1938 recognized her grandfather. Much of his biography, however, was a novelty to her, and she reached out to Karagudin with an emotional letter that you can see here, um, which was turned to an act of reconciliation, exceptional in the Russian public space. But relatives of other identified perpetrators, disturbed by the exposure of materials they consider compromising and hurting their families, started a counter investigation into Karagodin's activities, trying to silence the initiative and remove the documents from public access. The process is an open ended one, and we will see. Uh, it further unfold in the near future. As these curiously presented examples show, in the course of the 21st century, Soviet era domestic photo archives have remained mobile not only during moments of family transitions, but also in numerous public initiatives. Soviet uh, era family photographs remains um, a recurrent uh, and contested visual evidence for making sense of the past. Here you can see some of the exhibitions um, that were put together recently solely with uh, private photographs. Searching archives and family collections, many of young people began reassembling their family histories, filling in the gaps of silence or fragmented knowledge with archival research and imagination. The photographs unmatched ability to conjure intangible presence of past moments and people and to foster a sense of connection with them enables their viewers to use this incompleteness creatively, empowering the construction of new meanings and authenticating today's interpretations. 
What I would like to emphasize is that although photographic images are presumed to speak for themselves, on most occasions, there is a polyphony of voices that seek to speak for, through, and on behalf of the photographs. All of this should not trivialize the potential of family photography in contributing to the cultural memory of Soviet period in Russia, but rather foreground the complexities as well as imagination and creativity that accompany the viewing of these images that are only seemingly banal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana, for this uh, wonderful paper. Um, I finally turn to our photo demos colleague, Vindia Butpitiya. Um, Vindia is an anthropologist and curator whose research is focused on war, photography, and civilian resistance in Sri Lanka. She specifically explores the aftermath of civil conflict through the making and moving of images. Vindia did her PhD in anthropology at UCL, where she's presently research fellow, and she's also an associate lecturer in anthropology at St. Andrews. She also has extensive experience in the international development sector, spanning post-war reconciliation, transitional justice, and community environment relationships. Over to you, Vindia, that her paper is entitled, Went to Nothings, Photography and Absence in Northern Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, Kostis. I'm just gonna share my screen. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah, yeah. it's visible, yeah. yes. Perfect, uh, thanks again. Uh, so given that this occasion is centered on photography, I will be speaking through a series of photographs to give a sense of the visual and ethnographic textures of my research for photo demos, which is focused on the political work of photography among the Tamil community in Northern Sri Lanka. The Jaffna Peninsula and the Vani, where the images were mostly taken, were at the heart of three decades of armed conflict, which ended in 2009. The diverse photographies that I encountered while doing fieldwork were very much tethered to different kinds of coexisting absences, which is what I wanted to briefly speak to you about today. I see these long years of war and the many uncertainties of the post-war begotten out of a military victory as a violent process of making absent, one which has been revealed and countered by photography in the hands of a very diverse group of picture makers, keepers and sharers from young social media activists to elderly studio photographers and their globally dispersed patrons. Photography here is a medium of making present and confronting the state-sponsored erasures of landscape, memory, language, and history, but also political ideas and dissent, individuals and sometimes whole communities. This reflection on absence is also tied to the questions of photographic citizenship and deterritorialization that have been posed by Arila Azale. Um, the title of this presentation is drawn from a conversation I had with um, an elderly studio photographer in Jaffna. When I met Raja Ratna Mankal in 2018, he had been taking pictures for 60 years and only had perhaps little over 100 photographs to show for six decades of taking pictures of thousands of friends and strangers who passed through his studio to have their appearance, special occasions and life events and identity photos for passports and visas or new jobs taken um, by his camera. He said, I could have shown you everything, but they, meaning the Sri Lankan armed forces, destroyed the shop, took everything that was inside, threw it out and burnt it all. All the precious old things that were collected went to nothing. Went to nothing is a phrase that exists in both local languages, Tamil and Sinhalese, suggesting something of the abrupt and deliberate forced absence contrived by war and the state and the aspirant state's violence in the case of the Sri Lankan civil war and ethnic conflict. It is one which, along with Rajaratna Mama's archive, evokes something of the kinds of absences which are loosely parsed together in this presentation and are also ultimately made visible and present through and in photography. Rajaratna Mama was not alone in his loss. Uh, nearly all of my interlocutors, from photographers who had lost their life's work to others whose family albums were stripped bare by displacement or disruption, um, uh, faced these absences of images. As a point of contextual interest, Jaffna is also central to the very sparsely documented history of Sri Lankan photography. It is a vibrant history that has been severely fragmented by war. Studio photographers 
have acted as custodians of an oral and material history of photography where the war inherently affected preservation practices. Photographs, however, had been preserved in other ways, predominantly where the war had caused the practice of photography, even amid state imposed embargoes and sustained violence to flourish as images were intended that were intended to be transmitted to those outside the island grew in number during the war and in its aftermath. As another photographer interlocutor said matter of factly to me, just because there were bombs falling doesn't mean that people weren't getting married or celebrating birthdays. If anything, those things became more important. I have had customers who would run to the studio with a cake when curfew was lifted to have a family photo taken for their child's birthday. Where life became uncertain and untimely death was all too common, routine life cycle events became especially valued. Where transnational displacement and dispersal has characterized the Tamil community's socioeconomic and political fabric, such photographic mediations asserting presence um, played an important role in connecting the deterritorialized community. The inability to directly participate in the lives of their loved ones significantly shaped the output, circulation, and consumption of photographs that were being generated in northern Sri Lanka. Um, in the post-war, photography was also central to making other kinds of far more devastating absences visible, notably the absence of justice for Tamil citizens grappling with both um, the aftermath of state-sponsored atrocities from the final years of the war, and in, but also enforced disappearances enacted as a part of the island's competing regimes of state and non-state terror. One of the most visible uses of photography in post-war Sri Lanka was within the protests of the Tamil families of the disappeared. During the war and its aftermath, thousands of Tamils were forcibly disappeared on the island. A large number vanished following their surrender to the state in cases that have been termed mass disappearances. While others were detained or abducted in its aftermath due to alleged involvements with the Tamil militancy or simply political activism centered on citizenship grievances. Photographs of protesting families, specifically mothers holding up um, images of their children have become visual metonyms for the uncertainties and grievances of the Sri Lankan post-war, situating them also within a global visual repertoire of civilian resistance against state terror, as we have seen most famously in the South American examples, but also reminds me a little bit of Viliana's presentation previously. Identity card headshots, formal studio portraits, and family albums uh, snaps such as those we encountered in the studios were displayed alongside very grisly trophy images captured by soldiers um, generated out of the final months of the war. There was also a second layer of photography in that of the journalists and activists as well as state intelligence personnel who frequented these demonstrations, all of them simultaneously making pictures, taking photographs, making videos. So in this setting, we see then how the sort of dominant theoretical tensions are also in a sense tussling for visibility through a series of absences revealed or made present by photography. On one end, we have Tag's claim of photography as an ideological tool furthering these peculiar notions of governmentality, surveillance and archiving. And on the other side, we have Ariel Azale's invocation of photography as a medium for emancipation um, available to the oppressed. And one of the most interesting uses here was the use of state mandated identity photography itself, which you know makes me think of Taslima's uh, presentation earlier. Um, these were wielded um, by protesters, as we see here, um, on demonstration days, evidencing that the photographic image and the presence of the disappeared as was once recognized and authorized by the state. The gazers of the national identity card portraits who reverted back at the state in the absence of accountability and justice for the community. Here photography's um, co-option into um, governmentality is defiantly appropriated and subverted. Its narrative of post-war is actively challenged through images of its own making in this transient shrine for lives lost in a conflict that was precisely intended to weaken the state. The recasting of identity photographs was not simply about individual loss, but also a collective tacitly national making visible of a politically constituted erasure and absenting instrumented by the state in response to the a quelling a perceived threat to its sovereignty and territorial integrity. These users are in inextricable from an essential question of visibility, which affords both political possibility and risk, where the future of the struggle for Tamil self-determination is concerned. 
In a present that is defined by loss, displacement, dispersal, securitization, militarization, and state terror that blurred the boundaries between the public and the intimate, the causes and consequences of war generated new um, circuits of movement of mobilization, once more through images mandated and required by state actors and border regimes. Where citizenship remains impaired and unequal, studio photographers, for example, play a significant role in the necessary improvisations to seek out citizenship elsewhere. I previously alluded to the survival of photographs enabled by their transmission during the war years um, to those outside the country. And in the post-war, such practices have not diminished, but rather expanded to accommodate pursuits for new citizenship. Whether in facilitating the literal movement permitted for by auspicious passport and visa headshot photography or in capturing portraits to be circulated among marriage brokers with a view of securing a desirable marriage abroad, each facet of these post-war image making practices had in interesting implications for citizenship in an unlikely expansion of Azule's um, reformulation of citizenship through photography. The interconnections between these very diverse ethnographically sort of, you know, um, articulated absences helps us interrogate the empirical disquiet between the theoretical positions on photography as ideological tool and emancipatory practice. Um, justice and reconciliation, especially where civil conflicts are concerned, remain elusive as they are left to the design and operation of state actors who are perpetrators of violence and face little to no pressure for justice or accountability. The reality of those looking to such institutions for protection, such as the example of the Tamil families of the disappeared, remain tenuous, just as their mobilization of photography and other visual media intensify, signaling a recognition of photography's powers to confront erasures and to make visible within spaces and violent processes of making absent. One of my studio photographer interlocutors once said to me that his photographs go worldwide simply before this reason. And in this final image from London, uh, very far away from Northern Sri Lanka, sums up um, this thought very nicely, I feel, where we see these images likely produced in little studios in Northern Sri Lanka, moving to these internationalized ambits of presence and visibility. So on that note, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Bindia, for this really wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so now I'd like to invite um, all speakers to come to the front, so to speak, and um, also invite anyone um, who wants to comment or ask a question to um, write in the chat box or open their camera and ask directly, perhaps also by raising by using the raise hand um, function. And perhaps as people are warming up, I can, I can ask um, briefly um, a question to Taslima and then Oksana and then Vindya, very brief. Um, Taslima, a question that sort of relates again to Susan Maiselis's work you seem to, in your presentation, in the COVID stuff, partly, obviously, for practical reasons to do with COVID, you're sort of moving away from the iconic photo, um, say, of the Rana Plaza that you showed originally. And one is one sort of is tempted to think about uh, depictions of squalid working conditions, like in Salgado, which I idealized very often, and they have this theological and vastly problematic in ways um, aspect. And you're sort of turning to the indigenous media, what people do with their own photographs. Um, so one, one question is, is this an anthropological turn, so to speak? And can you comment on the political effect effectiveness, whether you think that these social media self representational material you're showing what do they do in compared to your famous sort of iconic Rana Plaza um, photo? And then uh, to Oksana, your, your, um, presenta your presentation really uh, picked up on certain things that Nestan has uh, had also conversed for reasons to do with the context and historicity of it. Um, but in, in both of these, perhaps we can put them in conversation, the imagery of the everyday, the demotic, the, fam the familial, becomes a sort of site of destabilization of the regime. And this also further relates to yesterday's uh, presentation by Sophia and how the Cambodian, it's, it was there in the wings, the way in which uh, the family was featured in the Khmer Rouge or 
was not featured in the Khmer Rouge uh, regime. And finally, for Vindia, just a comment. Um, the way you um, wrap up at the end, one one is sort of left with a thought that there is um, you have these two theoretical models that you very nicely describe, but then one can also think that we are dealing with an inherent paradox of photography that by capturing uh, it becomes a tool and at the same time it becomes a self-incriminating or it becomes a self um, self destabilizing medium that is uh, that opens up a sort of infinite uh, reuses and returns and sort of um, turns again ag turns against itself potentially so this is part of a perhaps an inherent paradox to do with indexicality and the and the medium Selena, would, you, would you perhaps to like to Selima, would you like to go first and say a couple of words? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that uh, when I've taken the photograph of Rana Plaza, collapsed the iconic photo, and before that I have taken uh, the workers' life and struggle uh, images as a witness. Uh, but when I have started to collecting photos from uh, workers and from their family, I think it it is important for keeping the um, the history, and it is uh, important for archiving. It will be more powerful uh, by engaging people who are living in this condition. So, when I started collecting images from uh, workers and their family, uh, I think it's a collective um, process, and through this process, we can keep our history. Uh, and usually uh, we couldn't find the history of uh, working class properly, which is very important for us. So uh, it is not possible for uh, a person to keep or narrate everything, but uh, who are living in this life, it is important to work together. And when we think that, yes, it's my, I am representing themselves, but it's, I think it's not possible to represent uh, a community without um, uh, focusing on their own uh, work or own um, I think, uh, think collective collectively, which uh, make our history, make our struggle more uh, strong, yeah. Great, Oksana? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's actually a very um, important and complex one. And I didn't, uh, of course, have a capacity of uh, going uh, back to the Soviet time, to the whole um, history of the amateur photographic movement, which is a fascinating uh, story in itself, because there you actually have a state very actively intervening into shaping the amateur movement and having its its very specific expectations from, from what it wants the amateur photographers to do. And then um, life is much more complicated than the desires of you know those who want to control and direct everything. And and uh, especially in the post-war context, amateurs become really um, a, a booming um, booming activity, booming subculture, which is uh, partly supported by the state and financed by the state in terms of photographic film clubs and so on, but it also becomes a very uh, common practice. So uh, a lot of people are having uh, makeshift photo labs in their own bathrooms. And there, of course, uh, you know, they can experiment as much as they can. They're still relying on the manuals that are produced um, through the official publication channels, but nevertheless, the capacity of actually uh, experimenting with the uh, photographic medium um, really expands uh, there, especially in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And, and when we come into the um, into the post-Soviet period, then uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that the range of interpretations uh, is really wide. So yes, it can be a site of decivilization, but it also can be a site of you know, reproduc uh, reproducing uh, a very kind of mainstream um, 
uh, official discourses uh, that that are communicated in the public sphere. So, what amateur photography allows us uh, to do is actually, you know, having uh, a very very wide range of um, of discourses. Um, projected on it and supported by the amateur images. But that range in itself is a fascinating um, thing to explore and study. Thank you. Okay. Mindia, would you like to say something before I turn to the raised hands? No, I was just going to say, I think uh, it's a good point to bring in your work on ambivalence, no? about how ambivalent lends itself to the ultimately unruly sort of you know trajectories of photography i'm sorry karen isn't here but also thinking about what she was saying about the image event yesterday and you know i think um ariela has his own work on the event of photography and what that means so i think it is that what makes all, all of what we do so interesting hopefully yes um two raised hands chris uh, would you like to do, go uh, yeah i had a question for taslima um uh, as i um it anticipated a very powerful presentation, uh, but I was struck by the um, material you showed briefly from the earlier um, Dream and Reality project, where you contrast um, stu local studio, in some sense, self photography uh, as part of the dream, and then your own photojournalistic representation as the reality so so you have the that opposition between those two practices but when you then presented the covid era self-made images they look much more like the you know the the photojournalistic reality rather than the self-imaged dream so I'm wondering what happened in in that space in between. Did did the workers discover that, um, or is it evidence that workers were pressured by studio proprietors to inhabit a certain kind of dream that wasn't their own, but was the studio owners? Or is is it a function of the technology, because the cameras on the smartphones of clearly become extremely good or, or was it being in contact with you as a, a brilliant um, innovative photojournalist so so what happened between the dream of the studio and the reality of the workers own smartphone images um. Actually, when um, I collected photo from the uh, studio photograph from their family album, I saw that uh, they have taken photograph uh, from studio and they tried to show them in a different way that we usually uh, saw, look at them as a journalist. But uh, when they want to show themselves, they don't want to represent them in a bad condition. Um, um, and by that time, uh, when I uh, collected those photos from Brim and Reality Project, that time they were not um, that much uh, familiar with smartphone. That's why uh, they can go uh, to a studio in any occasion, and they can spend some money for taking photographs. Uh, but uh, in real life, it's not uh, possible for them because they aren't very poor, minimum wage, and they're struggling and they're sacrificing their uh, life, their youth, their nutrition, everything to survive. So in reality, they are struggling, but uh, in dream, they want to show themselves in a dignified way. And when in COVID period, we found that uh, they can use smartphone uh, that uh, they couldn't use uh, even in uh, when Rana Plaza collapse happened. That time when we were collecting photos uh, from missing work family, then we found very uh, low risk photos that have been taken by uh, poor mobiles or from studios, uh, so, uh, the passport size photos. But uh, when they started to use smartphone, 
it become more powerful that they are making their uh, real life, their struggle, they're capturing those photos uh, from uh, the after the COVID uh, when they are struggling for their day off and their wage discrimination and other thing when owners were not ready to make any emergency fund or uh, they don't want to give the, their wage properly. That time they were uh, using their smartphone, which I think it's very important that uh, uh, the, this uh, this tool is not uh, only about a tool that uh, middle class uh, journalists can use. So uh, this uh, this uh, smartphone, I think, um, make uh, a new way, new window for uh, them. Maybe they are not uh, familiar with it, but uh, it's it, it it it's a potential, I think through which they can um, tell about their story and their struggle by themselves. And it could be so confused still now that uh, still we are uh, living in an atmosphere of fear every time because of the political situation and the discrimination in the society. Uh, so we are always under threat uh, about our freedom of expression. We cannot uh, raise our voice properly. And when a citizen become a uh, woman or um, a person of uh, race or a worker, it is more vulnerable for them. So it is not so easy to use this tool and introduce themselves. And uh, so I presented their works in other places and. I was confused and I uh, decided that I don't need to mention their name because they are always in uh, surveillance and under threat uh, because of uh, their struggle and, uh, and the garment workers, they are making a uh, Uh, they always try to disorganize them, so uh, they are finding many ways to disorganize them. So if they can use these uh, image making tools, if they can uh, take a part of uh, making knowledge, uh, I think that is important because uh, we think that uh, the artwork, the making photography, making knowledge, all these things are uh, uh, by the, the middle class. So I think uh, there's a new uh, virtual media uh, make a new way. Uh, maybe we can explore it and we can uh, push our collective effort uh, to take part and to take control of our life. Yeah. Great. Um, Gabriel von Brook has, uh, has raised her hand. Would you like to uh, switch on the camera, Gabriel? You have to unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. Yes, um, I'd like to ask uh, Oksana about the intergenerational dimension uh, of the memories of those she interviewed who are descendants of those um, portrayed in the archives. And um, I'm thinking of uh, Greta Uhling's uh, book about the memories of the Crimean uh, Tatars who were deported under Stalin and where um, the second generation has sort of adopted the memories of um, their parents who had been deported but uh, and, and some, in, in some occasions it appears as if they themselves had been deported but they also come up with uh, new interpretations and even uh, correct the, you know, <laughs> hyphenated the memories of their parents. And I just wondered if that was um, relevant in any way. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the question. And indeed, there are a lot of um, traumatic histories that are um, kind of carried through multiple generations in the families. And um, we didn't specifically uh, choose particular communities or uh, particular uh, regions. We actually tried to make our interviews in five different locations to exactly diversify, um, um, you know, the, uh, the stories and also, um, you know, try, trying to understand to what extent local, um, 
local memories and experiences are important, but certainly um, topics related to um, repressions and um, other calamities uh, experienced in the 20th century by uh, people across the Soviet Union are present in many stories, just as silences about these um, traumatic stories are present and um, omissions and unspoken things. And uh, what we see, uh, and that's why I uh, also mentioned Marianne Hirsch's work on post-memory, we certainly see that the second generation tries to work with, uh, with the experiences that they maybe not personally lived through but, but inherited. But then it's not just the, the post-memory generation, but these are um, several generations after it and then somehow have to make sense of, uh, of these difficult histories and uh, sometimes very uh, complex histories where you in one extended family may have uh, both uh, victims and perpetrators just as um, in case of Denis Karagodin's um, correspondence with uh, the granddaughter of one of the perpetrators, it became obvious that um, her knowledge of family history until uh, she faced the, um, you know, basically biography of her grandfather that was put together uh, by Karagodin, uh, she knew that she uh, is also uh, a descendant of um, a victim of political repressions. And it was the other side of the story that was somehow missing from family history. So I think these are extremely uh, complex stories. And of course, we have um, also uh, collective experiences that are sometimes shared and transmitted through um, not only um, communicative uh, practices, not only face-to-face -face interactions, but also some cultural works. We have a number of um, works like documentary films made on uh, the personal experiences of um, Crimean Tatars, for example, and the deportations. But uh, when we go down to the, uh, to the family um, level and to the way that these stories are narrated and passed on, um, orally over the photographs or with the photographs or just imagined uh, by the descendants when they look through the photographs. This is what we try to tease out and there um, the questions of, of silences and the unspoken are as important as the uh, things that are uh, said uh, and, and told and passed on. Great. I'll quickly take two questions from the chat. One from uh, Evelyn Runge addressed to Taslima. How did you gain access to communities and how did you collect the photos? And one by Maria Kokinu addressed to Oksana. Did you find, uh, aside from the amateur photos, did you find photos from professional photographers of the Communist Party, like in the case of Socialist Albania? Taslima. Um, uh, from, uh, when I collected photo for dream and reality, that time also I engaged myself uh, with workers' right activism. Uh, so I have some connection and relation with workers. Uh, I spend time with them and um, I'm not a powerful person with a camera uh, for them, I think. Uh, and it's, it's, I, I feel comfortable when they think uh, I am somebody in front of them with camera. Uh, so uh, uh, I tried to collect them, their photo. If, um, uh, and when I collected photo from Rana Plaza's uh, missing workers, that time uh, from our workers' right organization, we said that we all dead and uh, missing workers' uh, images and information because uh, government and owners, they always try to make the number and they don't want to give us the actual number and it is very difficult for uh, dead workers family to found um, the compensation and other things from uh, government so and it is also important for keeping the history and it is um, from my side uh, this is very um, significant to keep the history so we when Grand plaza collapse happened that time uh, workers' family, they were moving around the uh, factory area and we tried to contact them and the rescue work was uh, going on for 17 days and they were at that place and we tried to collect 
a uh, few images from that place uh, at that time but after uh, 70 days they were moving from one place to another place we tried to collect phone number and information from the posters they hang on wall then we uh, contact them we uh, get some information from other workers we went their houses we contact with them on phone and they posted many uh, letters with images uh, to us. And this is the way we actually uh, collected the uh, photos. And uh, when I collected photos uh, from COVID period, uh, that time actually we discussed how we can um, share and how we can spread the news to community, to people, uh, because uh, the uh, journalists who are working in National Daily, they were not going to uh, workers' area. I am also not able uh, at that time to go. So we, we discussed how we can uh, do. And as some uh, workers' activists, they were sending uh, me images that, yes, if there is something happening. There, are, uh, there is some protest going on, please, uh, if possible, circulate this. So we collected all these things together. Um, and sometimes it was spontaneous, sometimes uh, it was organized. Uh, but when the COVID hit it um, first time, that time uh, they were so puzzled and they were threatened for their wages and they were threatened by the termination and other, uh, other things. So that time they wanted to spread the news and they make their own video, own images uh, and share with us, yeah. Yes, um, thank you for the question, even though I'm not sure I fully understand it. Um, when What you mean by uh, finding photos from professional photographers, uh, if you mean if they were present in family archives, then I can see. Sorry, can you repeat? Sorry, are, are you asking me something? Uh, sorry, no, I'm just answering the, the next question. Okay. <laughs> um, so, if you, uh, so this is to Maria, if you mean that, uh, or if you're asking if the uh, professional photographs were part of the domestic collections and whether we uh, saw any of them uh, during our interviews, then um, I would like to emphasize that indeed uh, the family um, photographic archives are very um, heterogeneous and idiosyncratic and they do uh, contain a lot of photographs which uh, we can uh, also describe as official photographs, that is um, ID photographs and also photographs from the um, so-called boards of owners that were done by professional photographers and that are representing kind of solemn portraits. There are also a lot of studio photography that is part of the um, uh, family photographs and uh, we are considering this as a single uh, collection, not differentiating in the discussions between the, the provenance uh, of, of the images, of course, inquiring as much as possible, what were the photographic occasions and what has been remembered about them. But um, we take the, the archive holistically in that sense. Um, as for, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, the qualification professional is, is also something very um, uh, blurred in a way because there was no um, professional education. So there was no official diploma that you would receive as a photographer in the Soviet Union. Usually these were kind of skill-oriented trainings and a lot of people learned by doing and a lot of people also having learned uh, on their own photographic craft could go on uh, taking um, photographs as commissioned photographers, you know, sometimes as kind of itinerant photographers taking uh, passport photos, for example, in rural areas, something that you have also um, seen in, in Nestan's presentation. So the whole uh, qualification of professional in that sense is, um, is quite uh, open and also, of course, not all uh, photographers that earned their living with photographing craft were necessarily members of the Communist Party. So that's an extra, um, an extra um, twist there. What exactly, um, you know, the question relates to. 
Great. Um, Olga Sevchenko has her hand raised. Olga, would you like to? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, well, thank you um, to the panelists and the organizers of this conference. Very, very rich set of presentations. Um, I have a, uh, actually a question to Vindia, um, but it comes, I think, out of our shared work with Aksana because we see a lot of ID photographs um, uh, in, in our field work as well. Um, and I was uh, really curious about the seriality of the images um, that you had on one of your slides where there was a frame that combined together individual ID photographs and some of them were in um, several numbers. So they were sort of identical snapshots, but two or three of them. And that of course sends you um, to, um, to the notion of sort of ID photography um, state photography in one way or another. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the question of in what capacity um, does photography in this case make, make people present? I mean, they're there as citizens, but it's not quite clear to me if they were sort of citizens in a Republican sort of democratic sense as subjects bearing rights, or if they're citizens more in the subject of sort of subjecthood or on the receiving end of state violence. Um, if there is a way to tell the difference between the two or any other, any other thoughts on, on that uh, subject. Um, sure, I think that's also a good point to uh, refer to Imad's question in the chat. Thank you for that about ID photographs employed during protests. I think what is central to the understanding, I mean, there are a few kind of moving parts, but I think what's central to the Sri Lankan civil war is that it was centered on an ethno-nationalist struggle because of impairments to citizenship, because of a sort of ethnicized hierarchy of citizenship entitlements that allowed a majoritarian state to privilege um, the majority community over its minority communities, right? So it was this demand for kind of, you know, parity of status and recognition for, you know, equal citizenship entitlements, which is, you know, ultimately at the crux of, you know, the civil conflict. And secondarily to this, um, Sri Lanka, for whatever reason, predominantly economic, um, didn't have a huge proliferation of personal cameras um, throughout the sort of, you know, 20th century. It was very much concentrated in the hands of the elites. And studios also catered for a very long time to people who were able to go in and afford to get you know portraits taken in studios which is you know a limited number of people what changes completely was the introduction of the registration of persons sort of um legal requirement in the 1970s early 1970s immediately after the first sort of anti-state insurrection in the sort of Sinhalese majority south in um Sri Lanka and the state sort of expedited its project of you know registering citizens and photography was a big part of it so a lot of the cameras that were used were donated by um, East Germany at the time actually and um, sort of became integrated so these were given out to studio photographers and what was previously inaccessible became something that was necessary so um, a lot of people who you know hadn't maybe had the opportunity had it have a photograph taken before had to go into the studio to have it taken because it was subsidized by the state. So if you look at, for example, a lot of, you know, memorial portraits of people, you know, um, who passed away in the sort of, you know, late 80s, early 90s in Northern Sri Lanka, a lot of the pictures that were used were from these early days of identity photography, which makes it super interesting. And within the sort of context of the disappearances protest, the kind of third strand of this is the fact that um, Sri Lanka has a very pervasive issue of enforced disappearances that has affected all of its ethnic communities, again, from the 1970s, beginning from this insurrection in 71. And, um, the use of ID photographs here becomes really interesting in terms of the sort of theoretical debates around photography where, you know, we see it as a sort of, you know, um, means of enumerating citizens, a way of categorizing citizens, et cetera, when the citizens themselves take these photographs into their hands and turn it against the state to sort of, you know, um, make visible um, the erasures of the state and the the erasures here are individuals, you know, members of communities and sort of political ideas, as I talked about before. So I think that's what makes it really interesting. And I hope, Imad, that also answers your question a little bit. 
Okay, I think we can go with one last question, which is in the chat and is addressed to you, Vindia. It's about the photos taken even during the time of crisis and sent outside the island. Other than the ones used in public protests, like the London one, do you have a sense of how they were used, what meanings they had for those who uh, viewed, received them, and who, and where those rec receivers ever located? Um. Thank you, uh, Dipali, for that question. So as I sort of briefly talked about, I mean, this is a much bigger conversation. Um, it was principally because, you know, people were separated from their families and they couldn't be present for life events, which meant that people were actively taking photographs. So birthday photography in Northern Sri Lanka is a surprisingly big deal, um, which I was surprised by because I wasn't expecting it. So, you know, people would, as I kind of, you know, previously alluded to, go to the studio with the birthday cake or whatever it is, you know, there are all these props and backdrops to have that sort of life occasion marked and these photographs would be then sort of transmitted to family members you know who'd sort of fled the island essentially there was you know Sri Lanka the Sri Lankan Tamil community is massively dispersed across North America Europe and Australia so you know I encounter these photographs as much in London more frequently than I do in northern Sri Lanka sometimes because they've been preserved within the communities better here because you know they're less precarious in that sense as well um, so this is also interesting now with social media and the ways in which these are then sort of digitized as it were and recirculated um, in order to kind of, you know, as part of these sort of burgeoning nostalgia projects as it were, particularly with the sort of younger generation of um, people in the diaspora who kind of feel separated or, you know, severed from this sort of, you know, homeland that their parents had to leave behind. Great. So if there's nothing else, um, that's, a, that's a good uh, point to end. Thank you very much to the speakers for wonderful presentations and to the audience for commenting and for being here. And we have our last day tomorrow, which starts again 2 p.m. London time, and hope to see you all there. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.